Okay, so it's Frontier of Computer Vision, um, but more specifically, it's Frontier, Frontier of Computer Vision as it relates to uh, PX4. We're not going to do anything super crazy, like show what some research lab might be doing somewhere. We're more doing what are the front, what is the Frontier of Computer Vision in PX4, and how does that relate to what you might be able to use, what we're working on, and what's going to be available in the near to near future, not too distant future. Um, yeah, Lawrence is going and to be leading uh, a bit of discussion around this as well. So the goal for this session is we have 40 minutes. We have not content for 40 minutes, but we've left a lot of time for discussion because this is not one of the topics where, you know, we have like four years development under the belt and it's totally clear where it's heading. It's totally clear where the contributors are, what the patterns are. This is fairly new. We're made good in roads. But I also would like to make sure that as part of today's discussion, we're connecting development efforts from various areas, also because it involves hardware, right? Um, Pixhawk is this canonical thing that everybody's using for flight control, but for computer vision, we don't have these canonical platforms, hopefully it will be multiple, where it's clear like, yeah, this board, this camera, maybe even this airframe just works. It's, it's more like, if I compare it to flight control, it's more like 2013-ish. So first question is, who is doing CV development here? Okay, that's, that's quite a few people. Um, would you want to briefly tell us what you're doing? Who feels comfortable sharing at least sort of the rough application? Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, what we are doing is uh, we are using computer vision to uh, solve precision uh, landing and uh, takeoff, which is, uh, I believe, a common use case if you if you're landing on not uh, in open space but in uh, like a constrained area like a ground station or something like that. So, yeah, that's what we do. And we use uh, vision position estimate messages to provide <coughs> accurate positioning uh, to the flight control stack. And we use an uh, off-board computer, uh, on-board computer with a uh, with a camera. So uh, quite a basic setup, but it kind kind of works. <laughs> Thanks. Anybody else interested to share? What I'm somebody back here. What I actually find interesting is that we have quite a few people working on it, but then. It, it seems like it's getting closer to the company activity. In our project, we have been doing with uh, ZCam and uh, Jetson. We've been doing like 3D reconstruction of a rubble field and then detecting suitable landing sites to land on in that. So that works pretty well. Cool, thanks. Awesome, more up there. Thanks. Hi, yeah, um, my name is Nicholas Amann from DLR, and we're doing computer vision for various, uh, or in various projects um, from um, detecting and tracking of UAVs uh, for counter measurements. Um, using optical flow or SLAM methods for navigation, using also um, yeah, radar or laser scanners, cameras for uh, collision avoidance and um, yeah, environmental perception. Yeah. Cool, anybody else? Yes, awesome. Um, I'm, this is Hein Lim from UBFI. We are doing um, integration of visual inertia automatry in, in this small drone. So if you want to check it out, just feel free to talk, talk to me. Um, so we are utilizing EKF2 for visual inertia automatry integration, and it works well. And we're also testing local planner and global planner 
with with this drone too. So it works it works well. Fantastic. So one of the things that we've learned as a community from 2013 on, because back then flight control was also this thing like, yeah, we're having this special controller and it's a lot better. And, you know, pretty much all of these companies are not around anymore. I think I would like to invite the people here if what you're doing is infrastructure, so to speak, not crash into something or other aspects consider working with upstream, contributing to that, also safe landing, that is just hygienic. That's not, that's not something um, like what we showed on the demo on the field yesterday. Not crashing into something on landing, and I'm not talking about sophisticated landing site detection, you know, that could be a business value where you can essentially offer that as a service. But not crashing into something is the same thing as not falling out of the sky. This is not something you can differentiate with. That's not customer value. That's not a reason why somebody buys your drone. It's just a reason that somebody doesn't buy your drone if it does it. And that is the reason we're active in these areas upstream because people expect that. People expect things to be safe, to, that you're working on safety. And so I think it's, it's important also to have that discussion on differentiation. We don't want to parallel efforts that are really on top of the open source stack, but at the same time, not everything that is technology is differentiated business value. And so please, please take that feedback also a bit back to your company, think about it. I've seen the same pattern in 2013, and again, none of these companies is still around. They're all gone. Um, so the uh, around computer vision, there's uh, the thing is computer vision is expensive. It's complicated. It requires heavier components. All of these problems. So why do we want it if it's got all of these difficulties? And the real the real issue is that with drones, as they become more and more autonomous, we need to be able to enable them to still be safe even in environments that we don't know about. There's um, Think of dynamic environments, think of uh, environments that haven't been mapped before, think of uh, BV loss when there's an emergency, uh, these, all of these things in order to be able to safely operate as, uh, as a drone in these, in, in these kind of problems. We need to, computer vision is, it's an easy way to solve these, or easy in relative terms. Um, and why computer vision and not, uh, not a whole host of other sensors? And it's really because we have these awesome cameras that we can leverage that are very, uh, they're available from a lot of other industries, from starting, it was starting with uh, photography, starting with all of these other places. We have extremely high bandwidth sensor data, and to the point where I don't think we're actually getting other sensors that have the same bandwidth coming out of them and especially the remote sensing capabilities of them. It's not just bandwidth about what's happening right where you are, but it's bandwidth of your environment. It's what's happening around you, and this data can tell you a lot uh, that other sensors can't actually get you. Um, and the other thing about computer vision is that humans do it inherently. We have a big chunk of our brain that is very uh, heavily adapted towards processing vision information. And so for us, we should be finding that designing computer vision algorithms are a lot easier than potentially a lot of other types of algorithms from another, a lot of other types of sensors, just because we intuitively understand how to deal with this kind of data. So in the current drone industry, there, computer vision is used in, uh, in, it's mostly these three topics. There's a few special cases that are using other places, but um, it, we can basically summarize it with these. There's collision prevention, and that includes landing systems, making sure that you don't have a crash. There's VIO, which is uh, visual inertial odometry. That's navigation with just a camera, a single camera, and or maybe multiple cameras, and an IMU. And you can theoretically, if you have good enough sensors, do very, very accurate navigation just using these. 
and the other one is uh, follow me tracking. These these kinds of things that you see when, uh, for, specifically for autonomous filming applications, these kinds of things when somebody's running around and the drone is following them. Um, but so I, I think yeah. for, for these things, again, we want this to be interactive um, and, and not bore you to death with uh, an extensive summary of all the things we can do. So out of this, the third part is certainly something that is more a, what, what an application, right? So that's not something for an open source project in general. You, you don't want to do everything. Um, and going back to the first two, collision prevention, VIO, GPS denied navigation. What else is there that you as a developer or as a company would actually need in terms of just having that functionality there? Maybe you're not interested in developing it. Okay, I'm, I'm coming up there. <laughs> and so I think the next person will then raise their hand down there because it's fun. Um, I had two, uh, two things. One is ship landings. Uh, we from the industry get more and more requests for um, ship deployed drones. So and that's obviously landing on a moving target, basically. Exactly, yeah. yeah. yeah so that, but not only landing there, also really identifying what the nice H mark on the, on the landing pad is or whatever indicator you put there. Uh, and also, I, I have more of a question uh, in terms of collision prevention. Um, the last update I had was that f that works pretty much all right for quadcopters, but not so much for fixed wings. And I was wondering if there's already some some mo movement there. Yeah. So, uh, so on fixed wing with collision prevention, it's harder because, well, one, you have a lot higher uh, air speed or ground speed in this case, because usually your objects that you would be collide with are not moving in the air, but they're on the ground. And this means that you need higher sensor range. And the other thing with fixed wing is they're generally less maneuverable as well, which means you also need higher sensor range. So at the moment, I think it's, uh, well, there's two components. One is a sensor limitation, and there are ways around it. You could do a kind of a monocular slam where you're building up a whole world as you fly around. And Julian, the I think limitations on this are for, for the benefit of the audience, yeah. which are not CV experts, I think yeah. the simple answer is you can use the same algorithm if you have enough range, which is limited by the stereo baseline, which means you need like, like half a meter camera baseline, which is a problem mechanically. Or you use a different sensor. Because key thing that's probably not clear here is Collision prevention is operating on a 3D point cloud, which means you can use radars, which means you can use LIDARs, you can use anything that gives you 3D data. And in turn, that also means, yes, you can use it on a fixed wing, but only if you have a sensor that gives you enough range so you have a useful response time. There, it's yeah. The the difficulty is you need very high, accurate calibration between your camera orientations, and the bigger the spread, the more flex you get in your system. So this is why you see most of them are this big between the stereo lenses, and the ones that get bigger become very heavy very quickly, and that's just to stiffen up the system. Yeah. Uh, it's for so that you actually have an accurate calibration so that you know that when this pixel aligns with that pixel, it's exactly at this point off in the distance. If you then add a 0 0.5 degree twist or less, um, the, and that's easier and easier the bigger your system, the, the pixels don't align anymore, and then all of the assumptions that the uh, computer vision algorithms that can run in real time can use uh, they sort of fall away, and you end up having to step back to super slow algorithms that generally take hours and run on desktops. Uh, for fixed wing, we are very interested uh, 
in obstacle avoidance. And I think when you do in uh, fly in fixed wing, for example, in precision agriculture, uh, you have a lot of older, uh, predefined obstacles. And maybe in the flight planning, uh, just a good flight planning would bring us ahead. We had initiated the project in Q, uh, Q ground control, but it failed. Uh, but uh, well, I think it was an engineering problem. But I think that's that's important that on the fixed wing that we can determine the poles and so on the fix, uh, obstacles. Yeah, uh, anything you can solve beforehand and not have to solve in real time, and until the real time system is good enough, is definitely better to do it that way. Also, if you're solving it beforehand, generally you have more context. You know that if, you know, if, if the operator sees that, oh, we're not going to fly around this area because there's a, a something there that we know there's an obstacle, then the operator knows, oh, maybe I just need to raise the flight elevation because I actually care more about complete coverage than I do about being at this low altitude. Yeah, so the, the, the reference was to, um, to the integration in Q ground control, which isn't quite there, right? So it's just terrain data. So it's not, it's not actually having any obstacle data or sh should also not have. So that's, that's clear. But I think integrating, integrating data also flying vehicles, and we have some initial integration in PX4, or any other type of predetermined or otherwise announced obstacles, like from a transponder, that is certainly part of the total solution. Yeah. So computer vision, the thing is, there's a lot of cheap and easy ways to get around using computer vision. And I think a lot of, for a lot of use cases, right, computer vision, you have this super high bandwidth data, and then out of it, you extract a couple obstacles, and you know to not fly in that direction. And we can also do that with cheaper sensors. You can do that with a, a single point laser distance sensor or four or five of them pointing roughly forward. And you can do that, use that to get a large pr com uh, component of collision prevention. Optical flow gets you most of the way to VIO, although you need laser, uh, distance sensors or something of, this, of the like. And uh, follow me tracking, which is probably the most advanced usage of computer vision that is actually regularly deployed on drones, is just target, G you can do it by just following the ground station GPS location. There's not a huge amount of work that has to actually be done there. Um, so the, the, this is sort of where, where the industry is. It's depending on the level of drone you're at and the level of component you're at, you'll, you'll get usually a selection of these and you'll either end up in the right column for the cheap option or the left column for the expensive option. And yeah, so compared to PX4, what do we have? Um, the, we've got the collision prevention, we've got the VIO. Uh, the sonar laser sensors, it, there's a PR that's currently open. Um, it just needs a little bit of brush up work. And the only thing we're really missing is the vision based follow me tracking. But to be honest, that's very manufacturer specific. Most that's very consumer specific as well. And I think a lot of people aren't actually interested in that. And so that's probably better left up to the people who want it. Um, yeah. Uh, so we have some videos here of this is avoidance running on, as you can see, a fairly big drone. Um, to those of you who were at the, there was a demo after the CoreDev workshop on Wednesday. That's the same tree, um, and that's a IF 750A that's doing the. Can you just rerun the video? Yeah. So the drone is here. It's not the best video, but it's a developer conference, right? So as you can see, it avoids the tree. And I want to just highlight a couple of things. First, it's a fairly smooth motion at a reasonable speed. Uh, so it's not some toy example. That's Can you rerun it again? Uh, that's not you know, just there. Um, you can see the attitude is reasonably smooth. So. The control outputs are not scary. It's just continuing around it. Now, of course, um, it's not very useful to avoid a single tree, right? 
but this is an easy test setup. Uh, we've also tested this on power poles and things like that. And I believe that this overall is going to be in a fairly good shape for products uh, this year. And the main thing actually missing is the hardware integration. Having canonical, good, cheap, embedded hardware that has the same integration level as a Pixar for flight control. And so that is also something that we're talking to hardware vendors and where we are interested to push a bit of a reference design so that, or multiple reference designs and building patterns so that it becomes easier. Because as long as everybody in this room is building their own computer vision system, we will not have consistency, we will not have productization, and all the individual efforts to get your particular build stable are in a way wasted. And they're not really adding value if you're building a product. So another thing we have, uh, hang on, how do I actually escape this and get to the next video? We have to go to the next video and present again. Okay. So this video shows pretty much the same demo as you saw yesterday, so it's actually much less exciting now. Um, it's, it's the safe landing, and I think now that we have all here and focused, I actually can quickly explain what the thing does. So it's by design a deterministic algorithm, so we don't want it to do random stuff, which means it approaches the desired landing zone, and then if it finds that blocked as it is in sensor range, it goes back up to a predetermined safe altitude and then runs a spiral pattern to see where the next best point is. You could also say, like, why are you not optimizing the surface for a gradient, find the exactly next thing? Well, the reason is simple. That spiral pattern is extremely predictable, and regulators like predictable. And in that way, you have a better situational awareness, you have a predictable system, but that also means you kind of see in the motion that it sort of does unnecessary backtracking. But that's exactly by design. Now, we probably will do that a little more integrated and faster and everything, but right now, the main argument is, hey, we can do BV loss cargo operations with this, and for that, we need an approach where that is really easy to explain, that is really repeatable, and that doesn't take input data to determine the next landing location. Instead, it checks landing locations that have been predetermined so that you can exactly say, well, it will not land beyond position X, Y in that time frame. So, um, in terms of the capabilities of computer vision, the, I think the easiest way for us to look at it is what do humans do, and you can also look at what animals do with it. And the, the most obvious one is localization. Yeah, I know where I am in the room because I can see where everything else is, and I can see refer in reference where I am. And from the perspective of I can see stuff, I know what my location is. Um, humans also use it for recognition. Uh, this is my friend whatever. Um, I'm going to follow them as they walk around the corner. And we also, we, we build maps, we, uh, you know, you, you f hold an understanding that if you go out of, the, um, out of the lecture hall and you turn left, you can go in one direction, you can turn right, you go the other direction. If you go straight, you can go up the stairs or up the elevator. And these kinds of things really help and they allow us to be autonomous. They mean that we don't need although maybe we're going in the other direction now, but you don't need the phone with the map on it to be able to do everything, right? <laughs> um, the other stuff is stuff like minimum risk path planning. If you need to get from point A to point B across a muddy field, you might go from patch of grass to patch of grass and not walk through the deep mud the whole time. Uh, if you want to sit down, you're not going to sit down on a cactus, you're going to sit down on a chair. And all of, like, all of these things that we use, we use the vision information in context in order to plan everything that we do. So there's a lot of stuff that we could be doing with the vision that we don't. 
and instead we're using this amazingly rich data source for very simple uses, and that's really just because the field is in its infancy. Um, in academic projects, we do go a bit further, uh, but academic projects are generally not designed to be robust, work in any situation, uh, and where the academic or the person who's doing it doesn't get to choose where it's being used. And in industry, it's exactly the opposite. You're going to take a product, and you don't get to choose that it's being used in direct sunlight or in shade. You don't get to choose if it's being used on a cold day or a warm day. It has to work in all of these situations. And um, although we have all of these amazing projects, we have map building, we have um, safety analysis, the, all the of this The question stuff. for me would be, what are you interested in um, from a product perspective? that is maybe up here or not on here. We, we had that earlier discussion, right? But now that you've seen a bit more, anything that crosses anybody's mind here where they say, actually, that's a perception problem, we need that. Uh, the object classification, if you want to find people in... Uh, catastrophe situations or count cars or something. That that could be very interesting. Okay, so I think that's interesting. The question, is that the job of an operating system? Or is that the job of an application? Because for, for two reasons. One is we want to stay focused in what we do here. And the other part is we need to be a bit careful to not confuse our adopting companies by going very deep in specific applications, which starts to look like the open source project is actually competing with solution providers. We don't want that. We care about the things that keep a drone in the air, keep a robot moving. And so I think it's highly relevant, but I also think it's something that should be solved by a lost people, like a search and rescue company that specialized on AI for search and rescue. To say something. I'm not in this type of work, but I was working for automotive before. And from my experience, the object classification is the base for avoiding the collision. This is the base. You can predict the movements. And this is the missing part in this moment, in what I saw. So I, I also think that, yes, so if we could detect humans, we could do a better job at not landing on them. That's that, well. I totally agree, but I think we have fundamentally problem, fundamentally different problems in the drone space. So, in the autonomous driving space, you have the problem of dealing with the environment around yourself. The navigation is actually not hard. Um, in drones, it's the opposite. We can stay clear of pretty much anything. There's a lot of free space because we're in a 3D space. Um, but there are a couple of things that need to be avoided. Other aircraft, yes. Um, I'm personally a skeptic of using computer vision for that, having a computer vision PhD. Uh, it's generally really hard to see a small dot in a big sky. Um, and radar does a really, really, really good job at finding small dots in a big sky. Um, but yeah, I mean, dynamic obstacles are certainly a thing. But the framework we're building right now for PX4 can deal with dynamic obstacles. So it's something that inherently can be addressed. And we've specifically chosen algorithms that are not building a global map and building something that is hard to do with dynamic obstacles. So that is where we want to push for a level of sensing that doesn't require a ton of history. Yesterday showed us a session about uh, regulation efforts with uh, uh, FAA, and one of the things you said that uh, you need to you do not need to handle uh, not flying above people because the system is safe, but not but you need to prove that for each reference implementation. But if you have a generic PX4 uh, open source, 
Maybe you want also to be able not to fly above people in order to support uh, different regulations about that. I, yeah, I, I think that could be certainly helpful, uh, having a people detector and then not, not flying over crowds autonomously. And for me, that's, again, a same thing as same land, safe landing. It's staying compliant. So I, I could see that. In terms of onboard compute hardware, I don't think we have a slide on it, but actually fairly, fairly uh, relevant. So what... Let's let's make it simple. Like, who is using a Raspberry Pi? Okay. Uh, who is using a Raspberry Pi but is hitting the performance limits of it? Okay. Um, what about any so, sort of, let's say, low-end Intel? So an app core or something like that? Ah. <laughs> Good. Um, High-end Intel, Nook or anything like that. Okay. Um, what I probably should mention, let's try to stick for now to something that you plan to productize, because otherwise we're starting to mix academic and uh, deployment use cases. Good. NVIDIA, um, something small like... Okay. Um, who of the NVIDIA users has actually written proper GPGPU or CUDA code to leverage it? Okay, that's, that's interesting. That's exactly what I thought. It's like we're buying all into this performance potential and then nobody's realizing it, which is, by the way, why we're supporting NVIDIA at Autarian, but we're really focused on the Intel platforms because you get right away the immediate performance. Okay. ARM, um, IMX. Nobody's working on IMX. That's really, okay, half a person. <laughs> um, what other ARM, like some of the, like Qualcomm SOCs? No. Samsung Exynos. Okay, one, two. Uh, anything else from ARM that I haven't mentioned? That was a trick question. The NVIDIA boards are ARM too. <laughs> yeah. So GP. So GP GPU. Yeah. Okay. Uh, FPGAs. Okay. Back. Yeah, yeah I, I saw that. So, any other compute platform I haven't... Can you just raise your hand and shout, like, any class I haven't mentioned? Yeah, anybody using AMD? Yeah, they have some... The Ryzen series is pretty good and embedded, so... I think they have a, a branding problem. Um, good. So who is happy with their processing pr platform in terms of power, thermal, weight? Okay. Two people out of roughly 20. Uh, who would need something that's better packaged? You know, smaller, better cooling, more productized hardware? Yeah, that's a huge, of, huge market potential right there. Good. Then let's query a little more. Um, cameras. Who is using an Intel RealSense? Okay. Who is 100% happy with the Intel RealSense they're using? <laughs> okay. Structure core. Occip occipital structure core. You're not using it, Julian? <laughs> uh, good. Um, Z3D camera. Okay. Custom camera. That is a lot. So for your custom cameras, are you using uh, something like a point gray and a custom stereo head, or what are you doing? No stereo, maybe?
People are debating whether they can share that or not. Okay, so who is happy with the sensor choices that are available in terms of cameras? Good. Is it also custom? No, no, but okay, I, I'm looking for sort of mass market available stuff that's sort of cheap and kind of in the real sense space. Okay, so I, I, I didn't want to prime this discussion, but what we find is that both from a compute hardware perspective as well as from a sensor perspective, there is still work to do. Um, again, going back to the, the space that Pixar feel, fills in the flight control side, and it's good to see that uh, reaffirmed. I think it would be interesting to do a call after this uh, conference and maybe a poll for it and collect a bit little more requirements because we have manufacturers in the ecosystem that w would be probably excited to build something if they were just certain that there's enough volume out there to sustain the design effort. And so I'd like to help ma match that and also help them to get good product market fit by really being clear about what drone companies need for something that can be easily integrated. Yeah, so this sort of feeds right back into what we just talked about. Um, why aren't we using computer vision everywhere? And it's expensive um, in cost. The Although for a lot of drones, that doesn't matter if it's a small fraction of what the rest of the airframe costs. Uh, and then exactly, it's power and weight. And hopefully these are being solved in new generations, but we're, we're actually going to push for that as well. It's not just going to happen by itself. Um, the, there's other issues. There's reliability, lighting conditions. And to some degree, this is fixed with active sensors um, to uh, infrared pattern projectors, these kinds of things. Uh, but this is, again, this is closer range. This isn't going to fix your, it's not going to solve your fixed wing problems, right? So for this, you still need, I don't know, LIDAR, radar, uh, accurate ground maps, something like this. Um, and, yeah, uh, the, the cameras are better. On, the stuff on your iPhone is generally better than the stuff that's in most of the cameras that we can buy for computer vision, but this is also different technology. Um, yeah, uh, R&D costs are high, uh, the complex systems, like all of the integration effort, and the other thing with computer vision is it's black box for the most part. You have data in, data out, and regulators don't like that. And open source solves these. Yeah. So, uh, we need the purpose designed hardware that we just talked about. Um, we need the frameworks to correctly use the hardware. We need the way to link this together forward and backward and make everybody happy with it. Um, and we're, different things are in different states, uh, but <laughs> we're, it, it is getting forward, and uh, yeah, we're, we're going to get there. Can you maybe walk us quickly here, specifically through it, quickly, but specifically? Sure. Um, so, the, in terms of hardware, the, the bandwidth between the flight control and the companion computer, right now this is limited to something like, a, maybe you can push it to a 1.5 mega serial port. Um, but then you might have reliability issues. So, the, yeah. Um, and if, we, if you want tight integration between your computer vision system and your flight controller, you need that bandwidth so that you can synchronize these two systems together tightly with, uh, with the IMU data, with the commands so that you don't have jerky movement, all of these kinds of things. Um, it needs to be cheap enough, depending on, depending on your platform, of course, but for real scale, for mass market stuff, we do need to get the price down. We have to remember we're not trying to fly computer vision systems around for the most part, unless you're a surveyor. Uh, but everybody else, the computer vision system is just added weight, and we'd like it to go away and just get the capabilities. Um, and widely available. If you have, uh, if you have limitations in how how much you can get, how much in quantity and lead times, then 
yeah, the export re regulations, then people aren't going to be able to use your stuff. Um, yeah. So I, I think specifically there are a couple of things that we're addressing right now. So one is adding Ethernet to the autopilot design. That's really important for deeper integration. That's happening. Um, we will hear more about that in the next session. The overall PX4 to ROS2 communication is important because as you start to build more external sensor into it, you don't want to go through Mavlink every time and spend three working days just futzing messages through. That's horrible. You want to be straight through. And the promise of Mavlink is actually to be a stable API. You don't need that for your CV system. You need deep integration. Um, and then I think what we also are doing, but that is still ongoing, is figuring out, well, we have this flight control state machine control loop, and now we have external inputs. Like, actually, the mission cannot be continued. Actually, your flight trajectory doesn't work like you planned it. And we're figuring right now a lot of that out. Like, how can, be, how, how can that be done? What's architecturally better? Tightly coupled, loosely coupled? And... I actually would be interested to, to learn like how many of you are doing that and have you thought in depth about it? And quick background before you know, we, we hear from the audience. What I see a lot is that people just do off-board control, so they take the complete control away from the flight controller. So they, they put in pos positions or velocities. But what you end up with, if, if you want to take that outside of an academic lab, then you need to have low battery handling and fail-saves. And so you're going to re-implement everything you don't have it certified, you don't have it tested by a regulator, you don't have thousands of flight hours on it, or even more than that. So it's, it's kind of a losing battle. You're re-implementing PX4 outside without all the support that goes into PX4, so you're not going to get there. Which is why we're interested in interfaces that allow this more hybrid approach where you retain all that face to functionality, but feed in external inputs. So who, who sees... Who is like engaged with what's happening upstream on that front? And who feels they need more information? Like who, who thinks they need more information? Okay, that's actually a lot of people. So I think we need to make sure to, to have a more effective dev call or, or, and or documentation on it and a roadmap. Yeah. So we saw that coming. So, so the, the question is, do we provide synchronization features? And the answer is yes, um, in multiple ways. Either triggering cameras or reading timestamps. So it depends on the implementation, but yes. Yeah, I mean, you can add a, set up a, uh, an extra port that puts out a, a time trigger, or you can listen to a time trigger from a camera so you know when a frame is actually triggered and get a timestamp from that. Um, and the other side is that your serial link is slow as well. So you have to remember that even if you do have good timestamps, you're still going to have latency. So um, if Wh you... Which, in fact, is yeah. not a problem because a full USB frame transfer is usually something like 15 milliseconds. Yeah. So... Um, and to some degree, we can handle the latency. If you were watching Paul's uh, presentation yesterday with the delayed time horizon fusion of the EKF, um, but again, this is, yeah, it, it all adds up. Yeah, but that, that's how it's implemented. So you can use that today. And that is what we've done since 2009-ish. Step forward, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we've gone into this a little bit. 
already quite a bit. Um, but we're, sort of, we're, sort of we're also like in the last three minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do we have more slides after this? I can't remember. I should check. <laughs> um, yeah. So stuff, uh, stuff that just high level that I'd like to see. Uh, minimum risk path planning. So uh, somebody brought this up earlier of not flying over people, and that also goes over infrastructure. You don't want to fly over buildings. You don't want to fly over roads. And it would be great if we could do just a, a simple planning adjustment to say, okay, if you have to cross the road, don't fly across it very, very straight so that you spend a lot of time above it. Maybe put a gentle S in your pattern so that you minimize the time spent above it. Just little things like this. Um, full slam, yeah, everybody wants full slam. It's, uh, <laughs> but it's a lot of work. Um, RTL, if your GPS fails, how do you know where your drone is? How does it ever come back? Um, yeah, uh, structure following. Inspec the inspection people love this, but again, this is more application specific. I'm not sure if this should be part of the OS, as Lawrence was saying. If, and, if you're, if you're yeah. planning to work on inspection, like make sure to interface with the CV team because if we can build out the interfaces so people can do use case specific structure following on top of the obstacle avoidance, then we get there where we want, right? Not implementing something that the industry could as an end application, but still leveraging it. If you're kind of replacing the whole stack by doing your own obstacle avoidance, which is not actually nicely integrated with PX4, what will happen is that the obstacle avoidance will start to creep up into the application problem because others will come in and solve that problem. So important to engage in particular if you want to differentiate. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that would be one way to do it, and then also to feed sort of avoidance vectors and rejections into that, and so you can then essentially build an API on where you tell the system on the surface to go next, so they can cooperatively work. Yeah, and the last thing is actually something that's pretty critical, which is interfacing with all of these flight modes. And it's something that we're trying to move towards in the avoidance, and hopefully we'll be able to prototype it. But, yeah, it's, again, it's also application-specific. Not everybody only wants to operate during auto modes or things like this. Yeah. Um, so Lawrence went into the off-board mode. Uh, we can, uh, the 1.9 uh, trajectory injection, Martina is going to be presenting after lunch. And... Um, yeah, uh, the integration is really a big issue in terms of making something that isn't just for uh, a quick demo, something that actually works when people who don't know how to use it try to use it. And yeah, uh, <laughs> I think this really goes into what we've said. Um, computer vision is hard. Uh, we're here to help. We know the system pretty well, and the stuff that you want to do if it's something that everybody can benefit from, we'd love to upstream it, and it's not going to be a differentiating feature for long, so you might as well ha make sure that it doesn't break and that you don't have to maintain it. Um, and no matter how, hard, how much we do, it's never just going to be plug and play. You're always going to, for your use case, you need to think about how that impacts the stuff around you, but we can make it easy or at least easier. Yeah, um, that's it for this talk. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you.